everybody. Welcome to the Sherman Show. I'm Jeff Sherman here with my co-host, Sam Lau. Hey, hey. And today we have a very special guest uh, coming down from the land down under, from the OZ, uh, Mr. Gerard Manack. Uh, he founded Manack Advisors in 2013 after retiring from Morgan Stanley. Uh, he was a cross-asset strategist. Um, he's been analyzing, forecasting, and advising on financial markets since 1987, a year everybody should be very familiar with in financial markets. Uh, he's a fundamental factor-driven uh, investment professional, um, looks at valuation, currency, monetary policy, and someone we've been reading for many years at Double Line. So welcome to the show, Gerard. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Sam. Okay, well, uh, you're here. I gave you a little bit of an intro. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got into the business uh, prior to your days at Morgan Stanley. Well, look, I, you know, in a way, I, I stumbled into it. I, I'm an economist by training. I, I worked for a government down here for five years uh, doing economic forecasting. And I saw an ad in the paper that said, you know, we're looking for an economic forecaster, but the pay was so high. I thought, well, I can't go for that. Um, it was about double what I was on. And then uh, six months, six weeks later, it came up again. I thought, well, if they haven't got someone, I might as well go for it. And it turned out to be uh, responsible for quarterly forecasts for a uh, uh, an independent research publication for markets. And I started on the day of the crash in 87. Wow. Um, now, of course, in Australia, it was actually the next day, but technically it was the Monday. Um, but the publication I took over had in the prior quarter forecast a possible market crash. So on the day of the crash, everybody was ringing up to find out who's responsible for this publication. You've had a great job. You've called a crash. I thought, oh, that's obviously the way to succeed. And I've pretty much been calling crashes ever since. Um, and then I got onto to investment banks. I joined uh, Barclays, BZW. Uh, they in Australia then became uh, AB and AMRO. So I'd done British, I'd done European. And then I thought, well, the last one on the trifecta is an American bank. Uh, so I joined Morgan Stanley um, and uh, went through the, the GFC with them um, once again my trade of calling crashes was kind of helpful in the GFC. Um, and then after the GFC, I, uh, I set up Minac Advisors and uh, the rest is history. I'm my own boss and uh, I left behind the politics and uh, bureaucracy of, of big banks. And although I, I love my time at Morgan Stanley, um, no regrets about going independent. Yeah, I don't think you'll see an argument from Sam or myself about that either. Uh, after being controlled by a French bank at one point in time, uh, nothing better than spinning out and doing your own thing. So congratulations on that. So you mentioned calling a lot of crashes, uh, you know, called 92 of the last two crashes or so. Um, you know, what, what are you thinking about today? We look at valuation across the board. Valuation does not appear to be cheap um, in many markets out there. Um, how are you thinking about that? And what do you what are you telling your clients today? Well, the, the first thing to say is um, valuation is critical for medium term returns, but it's fairly lousy as a, as a guide to the near term. So if that valuation is going to work, you need a catalyst. Um, that's that's the first important point. But certainly, if you are an investor, such as a family office or a sovereign wealth fund that takes a, a medium to long term view of likely asset returns, uh, they look fairly poor. And, and the whole problem is valuation. Uh, the US obviously, on most absolute metrics, the equity market is at the highest level it's been in history or the second highest, only surpassed by the TMT bubble in the late 90s. And that inevitably suggests that you're gonna get mediocre to poor returns over the medium term. Now, last year I could have said exactly the same thing and you end up getting good returns. The reason for a little bit more caution this year is that so much good news is in the price, the consensus is so tightly clustered that I think that you're not, not necessarily looking at a crash this year, but I think there's a good chance that returns, at least in the US, will underperform. And the obvious catalyst for that, in my view, is, is getting a reflation in the global economy and a reflation is likely to drag capital towards other markets that are cheaper, but are also better suited to the sort of macro environment I think we're heading towards. That's the, that's the carrot to go somewhere else. There's also a stick in the sense that the US equity market's outperformance over the last decade has largely been explained by, by the well-known big tech stocks, the FANGs, you know the, you know the names, and uh, they not only look very expensive, 
but obviously I would argue face some regulatory risk because one thing, um, one of the few areas of bipartisanship in Washington is everybody hates Facebook. Um, and it's quite plausible that we'll see some regulatory backlash. So that's the stick. Um, so the rotation in equities could be what generates the low returns in the US that valuations have been warning about uh, for some time. And you say that because the indices or the market sticks and metrics we look at are dominated by these six names. And you've written a lot about the S&P 494 and stripping those out and looking at valuation. And so when an investor thinks about investing in the US, it's one thing to just do the index, right? Buy the S&P or pick out your favorite index. Um, but also there's another thing of looking under the surface. And so we've heard about the rotation from large to small, for instance. Uh, growth to value. Where are you sitting on those metrics? If you if you had to look at the S and P four ninety four, taking out the six mega caps there, uh, comparing that to value, kind of to small cap. How are you thinking about your U S allocation today? I, I'd still be slightly cautious. Uh, I mean, the driver has been those big six names, and and just to emphasise, there are only six stocks, but their combined market cap is is larger than every other equity market in the world. Uh, it's about the size of the corporate bond market and, and rather humbling for me in Australia. Uh, last time I looked, four of those six names are by themselves larger in market cap sense than the entire Aussie equity market. So th these are asset class size in combination. The rest of the market still looks uh, expensive compared to the rest of the world. And that's important because once you strip out those six, the earnings performance of the S&P 494, the S&P 500 XO6, is no better than the rest of the world, which is to say over the last five or six years, quite mediocre. Um, so you've got two big equity blocks, the S&P 494 and Global Equities X the US that have had mediocre earnings for the last five or six years, but the S&P 494 is trading at a PE premium of four or five big figures if you're looking at a, at a cycle adjusted PE measure. So it's hard to explain why that valuation premium is deserved for the 494 when there's no demonstrably better earnings track record. Moreover, if we do get uh, this general shift to broad reflation in global economies, then you want cyclicality, you want operational leverage and arguably the markets that offer that the best uh, include parts of the emerging market complex, certainly a large part of Japan and a large part of Europe. So my sense is, uh, even though the valuation excesses aren't that apparent in the S&P 494, they're still likely to underperform if we do get this broad global reflation starting in 2021. Well, you've been writing about the global reflation for a while. So why don't you educate our listeners on why you think that that could be a catalyst? You talked about the stick component of those other six names, but talk about the backdrop. What is the backdrop for the global reflation and why are these economies much better poised to leverage off of it? Well, well the, the frame here, the framework here, Jeff, is simply I've been a card carrying secular stagnationist since, uh, since pre pre-GFC, uh, I used to call it the world was turning Japanese, um, just rebranding it to the new sexy jargon of secular stagnation. The underlying causes of secular stagnation, in my view, remain intact. Uh, in fact, you could argue that the pandemic ha has intensified some of them. In particular, it's increased leverage, it's increased the adoption of, of new technology, and they are two of the, the, the half a dozen or so factors I think are behind secular stagnation. So why talk about uh, a possible sustained reflation? Well, the key to the story really is that the pandemic looks likely to be, in my view, the catalyst for a huge policy change. The handoff from three decades of monetary policy dominance to a new era of fiscal policy dominance. Now, this fiscal policy dominance where we see uh, large sustained uh, fiscal deficits where central banks uh, are playing a backstopping supportive role um, and at the moment doing that by fully monetizing most of those deficits. Large deficits don't reverse the underlying causes of secular stagnation, but they have the ability to be an effective antidote. In my view, the core economic uh, 
characteristic of secular stagnation is the idea that we have an excess of saving in the world. The private sector's planned saving exceeds planned investment. And that's what gives an economy suffering secular stagnation that sort of sogginess to it. You just can't cut rates quite low enough to bring planned saving and investment back together. Of course, if in that, that's the problem and the government starts running large deficits, that can counteract the impact of excess saving in the private sector. So if we do make this transition, I do think it will be effective in reversing the economic and financial consequences of secular stagnation. It will take time, but of course, it was the unfolding forces of secular stagnation that drove many of the dominant financial market trends of the last three decades. And the most obvious market trend of the last three or four decades was the secular declining rates. Um, if you look at, just pull up a very simple chart, a long run history of the 10 year treasury yield in the States. Since 1980, uh, while there was always cycles, every cycle trough in the 10 year treasury was below the prior cycle trough and every peak was above the prior peak. So unless you were trading treasuries in the 70s, I don't think any of us were, but unless you were trading treasuries in the 70s, you've never seen a cycle trough, a peak in the 10 year treasury yield surpass the prior peak. Now, I think that's ultimately where we're gonna head. That's the way I'm benchmarking this call that we're bringing the curtain down on secular stagnation. Now, in the current context, that doesn't mean eight or 9% treasury yields. That just means a fall. 4% on 10 year treasuries satisfies the condition. We're not gonna see that this year. We're not gonna see it next year. For me, this is a story of 2023, 20, 24. But if we do see that, then in eight or nine years time, we'll look back and we'll go, you know what? When the 10 year treasury yield hit 50 basis points in August, 2020, that turned out to be a super cycle low from 16% in the early 80s to half a percent in 2020, that was it. And now in a two steps forward, one step fashion, we're heading higher. And that's the circular, the secular change that I think we're on the cusp of. Um, and from that will come a whole lot of other stuff. But one of the features to go back to the equity context, it's simply wrong to say that equities re-rate when yields go to low levels. History does not bear that out. Normally, when yields go to very low levels, equities derate. And the logic behind that's fairly straightforward. Uh, the macro conditions that lead to very low yields are normally generating stiff headwinds for corporate earnings. And that's obvious in a place like Japan, which has had rock bottom low JGB yields for 20 years. Their market hasn't got more expensive. In fact, on most absolute measures, it's derated relative to the rest of the world. Now, what that means looking ahead is I couldn't think of anything more positive for Japanese or European equities than for JGB or bunds to, to lift in yield. If we got a bund yield or a JGB yield at one and a half percent, I tell you what, the macro conditions that has lift, led to that lift in yields would have set their equity markets on fire. Now, that doesn't apply to the US. It doesn't apply to the US because the US unusually re-rated when yields went down. And that's largely because the companies that led that re-rating were perceived to have earning streams unaffected by the macro conditions that led to very low treasury yields. I mean, what led the post GFC rally in the States was really two categories of companies. There was your so-called bond proxies. So as the name suggests, these are companies that may not have had a lot of earnings growth, but the, the coupon, so to speak, was reliable. And then you had your secular growth stories and, and the key phrase there is secular. So a growth story unconnected to the macro cycle. Now, by the way, this illustrates why it is wrong to say growth stocks outperformed because they were long duration. What you actually saw outperform through most of the post GFC cycle was a duration barbell. Your bond proxies were short duration, your growth stocks were long duration. What they had in common was not duration, it was the perception that their earnings were relatively unaffected by the macro conditions. Now, looking ahead, 
The problem for them is having re-rated with yields low, they will face some valuation headwinds if yields do increase. Not, we've gone to one, a bit over 1% on a 10 year treasury from 50 basis points. That's not been detrimental, but I would argue that the sweet spot for US equity valuations starts to sour if we get yields much over 2%. And there's no need for them to re-rate as we go from low yields to high yields because they never de-rated on the way down. But that's not true for other markets. So if we get a general reflation over the next three or four years, where we see a general upward pressure on long end rates, that would be beneficial for non-US markets, but not provide a tailwind for the US. Another reason to expect that this reflation is gonna be specifically beneficial to markets outside the US and be part of the reason the US market will underperform if the reflation is accomplished. There's a lot to unpackage in there, Gerard, but I did want to touch on, touch on something that you talked about in there with the idea of secular trend changes in part due to um, perhaps a reversal in the direction of rates. Um, and on top of that reflation, you know, sounding like reflation, what are your thoughts on inf the inflation component of that in terms of the higher nominal rates? We're sitting here with negative real yields pretty much across the curve. Um, break-evens are you know, showing some market expectations for, for future inflation. How does that all fit into what you just talked about? Look, if, if, we, get, if we get this shift to sustained fiscal expansion, particularly if it's backstopped by central banks, in other words, we have helicopter money, then look, this could end up with unacceptably high inflation, without a doubt. But uh, my point is that will take time. Um, there's no magic link between money printing and inflation. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. You need to go through the conventional processes of an economy running at an above trend growth rate that soaks up excess capacity, starts to put pressure on labour market tightness and wages, and then ultimately, yes, you could end up with inflation. But if we end up with something that is sort of, in a sense, too hot, having been for most of the last decade in an economy that's too cold, we're gonna go through an interim period where it feels just right. And that's gonna be, I think, the focus of investors over the next uh, couple of years. And what you're seeing happen in bond markets with the break-evens going up, they're still at levels that, you know, 2% CPI, lovely problem to have. And I'm sure the Fed would also think, lovely problem to have. Um, if we saw the break-evens go much above that, I'm not sure equities would for the moment take much notice, particularly if it was uh, in a context of the headline nominal spot rate being quite low. So higher break evens implies low and uh, real yields. That's, that's not a bad mix for, for equity investors. Um, I think that the real sting in the tail comes when we see sustained inflation above 2%, which I don't think we'll see this year. There'll be a brief spike due to base effects uh, in the first half of this year, but I don't think we see it until perhaps next year, but it may even be the year after. That's the sort of time frame I'm thinking. Um, and then ultimately, we obviously start to see a move on, on rates, uh, official policy. So I think the issue for equities will be, yes, I can see it ends badly, but I, I'm, I, I think that's two or three years away, um, particularly overseas where there's even more excess capacity and low inflation and rate expectations are even more deeply embedded than they are uh, in the US. But yes, absolutely. This could ultimately end with unacceptably high inflation. But I, I wouldn't personally be worrying about it today as a base case. I might be looking at some hedges um, to, to prep against the tail risk while they're cheap. But uh, my core investment strategy is going to be focused on the, the pleasant side of the reflation story. Yeah, and you talk about this coordinated fiscal response and a secular trend in, in fiscal authorities running the reins where the monetary side and the central bankers are no longer the masters of the universe. It's all about our electorates and, and congressional members who get us there. And so, you know, you, you talk a lot about the idea that inflation could be a couple of years down the road. We've seen a huge debasement of the currency just from the stack that we've done so much money printing globally. And it's this relative value gain. Um, you're talking about potentially this reflation. Reflation would lead to more demand, which 
could uh, have a bid for those currencies, right? As people need to buy in those local markets. How are you thinking about the currency game today? Um, I've, I've heard from a lot of pundits out there that, you know, well, look, the dollar is, you know, obviously the one that's running the largest deficit as a percentage of GDP, but also everybody's doing it. Well, not everybody's doing the same capacity. What are your takes on currencies? Is there a potential there or is that something that's more of a long-term to get a new kind of directional trend underway? I see it as a long-term issue, not one necessary for this year. In fact, I'm slightly bemused that there's such a strong dollar bear consensus out there at the moment. Um, I'm not, I can't make a compelling dollar bull case to be fair, but I'm not sure why everybody wants to be so short dollars. Uh, what we've seen through most of the post GFC cycle was uh, the key influence on FX rates was not relative interest rates, it was relative growth rates. And global capital tended to flow wherever the growth rate was, was higher. Now, this is not absolute growth rates. If it was absolute growth rates, we'd always see a solid bid for the renminbi. This is really, think about it, growth relative to the country's own trend. My view is the US is going to have as large a delta in growth last year to this year as any other developed economy. And that should be quite supportive for the currency. Um, now, as I said, there'll be other factors that may push against it a little bit, um, such as the larger money printing. I, I, I think the dollar's likely to range, range trade, which leaves room for the rest of the world to outperform in an asset class sense. But I, I don't think we're at the stage yet where um, investors are gonna price dollar collapse or the end of the, the, the dollar regime. Um, and I'd also highlight that, yes, in dollar terms, obviously the Fed is doing more printing than other people, but if you look at balance sheet expansion of central banks relative to their own domestic economy GDP, it's not clear to me at all that the, the Fed has been the, the, um, the loose bank. Uh, the BOJ obviously is the world champion in terms of balance sheet size relative to own economy and the increase in that over the last 12 months. The ECB is not far behind, the BOE is not far behind, the, the Fed isn't even on a podium uh, when it comes to the expansion balance sheet relative to GDP over the last uh, 12 months. So even on that metric, it's not clear cut to me that there's a strong dollar bear case. Um, so let's see, look, I'm very aware in FX markets that what often changes the direction of a currency is not when a fundamental shifts, but when the market's focus shifts to a different fundamental. Um, but it, yeah, even there, what, what would the market need to shift to? I guess arguably real rates, and that's an argument that's been put to me. But you know, let's not forget the reason that real rates are lower in a sense in the US is because inflation expectations have picked up, which is a sign of positive growth outlook. Um, so my, my base case is dollar range trading. If we end up with unacceptably high inflation, yes, there could be some uh, stress on the dollar, but I don't think the US will be alone on that because what we're seeing is uh, this shift to fiscal policy almost everywhere. Um, we're seeing that the unification of monetary and fiscal policy makers, and you can even see that in terms of the personnel involved. I mean, Janet Yellen, ex head of the Fed, now about to be sworn in as Treasury Secretary, uh, Christine Lagarde, a politician, uh, is now running the ECB. I mean, you're seeing the blending of the two sides. I don't think the risks around this are specific to the US. This is, this is a global policy shift, or at least in developed economies, a massive shift that we're seeing in a number of important centers. Well, it's a, it, I like how you talk about it's this global coordination. It's something we've been talking about for a while. But also one thing that I've noticed over the last cycle is that inflation appears to be a global phenomenon. It isn't localized unless you have just rapid currency printing. You can think, you know, uh, Zimbabwe, you can think about Venezuela and the likes. And there's those one-off cases. But in general, when you look at core inflation, you look what's happening, it tends to be highly correlated across the globe. So as you, as you talk about the reflation idea, it makes sense to me that's going to take a couple of years because everyone has to kind of coordinate to get that going. And because we all consume the same commodities, yes, in different baskets, but um, at the end of the day, it's that core side of inflation that really drives it. It's productivity, it's services, and it's goods, right? It's, it's amazing how trends uh, have been in common across countries, which explains to, to a certain extent 
you know, the relatively flat Phillips curves in a lot of countries, it's not been so much domestic conditions that's influenced inflation. It's been global conditions, uh, which means that, yes, I completely agree. We're unlikely to see a, a severe inflation breakout in one developed economy. My hunch is it's going to happen altogether, um, which, which clouds the view on which currency may bear the brunt of it. But it makes it quite clear that you're going to have a problem if you're investing in rate products because they're all likely to be doing poorly at the one time. Um, so th this is all this is all going to take time because we started with a world, let's not forget it, that in 2019 looked soft. We started in a world that had these structural headwinds to growth. And as I mentioned, I think the pandemic has intensified a number of them. And my simple factoid about how much room we've got to move before we can reach capacity constraints that could lead to inflation is just to look at non-farm payrolls in the States. Despite the tremendous growth in payrolls from the April 2020 lows, non-farm payrolls in the US remain further below their prior cycle peak than they were at the very worst point of the GFC. So we've got a whole GFC style recovery ahead of us. And yes, I can see the recovery will probably be faster than it was after the GFC. But we took four or five years after the GFC to get payrolls back to the prior peak. If we take, if we're twice as fast this time, that still means two years of strong growth to soak up all that excess capacity, which puts the labour market uh, constraint, not this year, not even next year, potentially it's a 2023 story. So it, it will take time. And before we get to that point, even with markets that do look ahead, there's a sweet spot as you transition from excess capacity, you have an above trend growth before you get the sting in the tail, which is the inflation pressures and the policy response. And I think we're in the sweet spot. The spot will be sweeter for the rest of the world because the US has re-rated to very high levels um, and don't have an doesn't have an equity market that's really going to benefit as much as the rest of the world will from this above trend growth. Okay, so I've got the playbook here. You're not really liking rates over the long term. You're looking at the rest of the world for equities. FX, you're going to kind of wait and see. Let's see what, what the market wants to focus on. There's one big elephant in the room that we haven't talked about here. And if you're talking about reform, what, what about the commodity story? I'm hearing this a lot. We get a lot from our sell side friends talking about this. This is really a new regime. The one belt, one road policy is going to help drive things. We're going to get this coordinated reflation, infrastructure, infrastructure. I heard that for five years now in the U.S., infrastructure. What is your take on the commodity story? I am actually quite bullish commodities uh, for this year. I mean, what, what history shows you is uh, the best cure for high prices in commodities is high prices. I mean, there is ultimately a supply response. So it's, it's dangerous to talk about multi-year cycles they don't happen very often they did pre-gfc and that was because of china's unprecedented expansion but no on, on, a, on a one year view i'm quite bullish and i think the elements of the of being bullish on commodities are simply you, you can see all around the world uh consumers have upped their spending on on goods versus services and that's partly because guess what the governments have mailed them checks and said you can't spend it on services because we're not going to let you um congregate with other people so that looks good you can see in a lot of places the leading indicators of housing and renovation is doing well. I guess that's, guess what? We've spent all last year locked up in our home office and we realised we probably need an extra bedroom or a bigger house. So that, that's got legs on it. You can see demand for autos uh, picking up. Once again, we're shying away from public transport you know, in a pandemic world. We, we're doing longer trips rather than flying, so cars are there. But I think the big shift, and this is this is not focused on China, this is elsewhere, is that we'll see, this is the year fiscal policy will shift from what last year was overwhelmingly uh, income support transfer payments from governments to this year programs that involve doing stuff. And it can be uh, environmental stuff, it can be infrastructure, and the prospect of that happening in, for example, the US has been made more likely by uh, I won't call it a blue wave. It's a, it's a wavelet. Obviously, it's a, it was a close call in the Senate. But nonetheless, um, you'd argue once again, infrastructure spending is probably one of the few areas of bipartisanship in Washington. So the US is a good example of where I think we will see this transition. So you're going to see this coming together of consumers spending more on stuff 
some of the leading indicators for CapEx are, are picking up briskly and government spending more on stuff. So we've already seen a fairly nice commodity takeoff uh, over the last uh, nine months, but I think it's got further to go. And, and therefore, one of the areas I'm most bullish on in the equity space is what I call the, the high beta uh, goods producers. So car makers, not necessarily Tesla, conventional car makers, um, you know, construction companies, uh, miners, I, I think they're all going to do quite well. They're all very cyclical and the cycle in those spaces look very strong. Um, whether it's a multi-year thing, I, I'd, I'd be a little cautious on that, but certainly it's got legs on it to play through a lot of this year in my view. Yeah, I like that. Uh, you're long stuff, you know, you're long people that make stuff. So Sam, you got another one? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, so I suppose central to all of what we've been discussing or what you've been discussing today, particularly around the reflation story, is the massive increase in debt in debt spending or deficit spending and then onto the, the eventual debt pile, particularly in, in sovereigns. Is there a problem there? How do we get out of it? Are we ever going to be let's just take the US as an example. We're at 130% or so of public debt to GDP. Can we ever get out of this type of range of north of 100? Is inflation part of the uh, manufactured inflation by the Fed part of that uh, scheme to, to kind of inflate our way out of this debt, or is there a, another solution, or is it even a problem? I suppose. Uh, well, my first response is to say it's not necessarily a problem. Um, un unlike people that that quite quote me, you know, work like Reinoff and Rogoff, Reinhardt and Rogoff. Um, I, I don't think there is any. Uh, historical evidence that high debt levels damp prospective inflation. Y yes, there's a correlation between debt levels and current growth, because often it's the some external shock that simultaneously depresses growth and lifts your debt ratios. But if you look at it prospectively, um, I can't see a link. And, and I'll give you a very simple example in the US. I mean, we, we are now approaching um, the record debt, public sector debt to GDP levels that were set um, in the aftermath of World War II. So the prior peak was 1946. Now, if you really thought high debt to GDP levels uh, led to weak growth, then you would have expected that the 50s and 60s were pretty lousy decades for growth in the US. Well, that's not how it turned out. And then the low spot for that debt to GDP ratio came in the early 70s, which were the 70s a great decade for growth? No, that's not how it's shaped out. I mean, it's almost got an inverse relationship. Now, I'm not taking it that, but there's, there's very little historical track record for high debt being a problem. But the bigger issue is this. Um, central banks are funding it. Uh, take Japan, which is the poster child for excess debt. Um, their gross public sector debt to GDP is now over 250%. And that's the number that people use to scare the children. Once you take account of their assets, um, they're down around about 100 points of GDP lower, so around 140. Once you take account of what the BOJ holds, uh, they're down below 50 points of GDP. They don't have a debt problem. And that shows you which way I think we're going to head. We're going to see these central banks sit on this debt indefinitely. I think ultimately they might as well just cancel it. Um, but they don't need to do that. I mean, uh, what effectively is happening is, is money financing of these deficits. And that, that turbo powers the fiscal stimulus. So we need to be aware of that risk. But ultimately, I don't think we need to be concerned about these high debt levels. I don't think we'll ever see these bonds back in the hands of the private sector. But the good news is we don't need to inflate it away. It's, it's been printed, printed away in a sense. Um, so all we need to worry about is a conventional inflation problem coming from over stimulus. Now, I recognise but what we are seeing as part of this policy transition is policy, the, the policy levers shifting from what has been in, in the hands of central bankers. So, you know, arguably people with, uh, without a strong political agenda and some technical expertise. Now we can debate what sort of job they've done, by the way. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're now handing it to, to politicians. I know the risks involved in that. Absolutely. Um, but you know, what we, we don't have the alternative of staying how we were because we ran out of monetary policy firepower. Now that we've got the politicians in charge, 
they'll probably waste some of the money. Um, they may end up with too, doing too much and getting inflation. But these are these are conventional problems compared to what was uh, the prospect if we didn't go to fiscal of being even deeper in the funk because we had run out of the ability of monetary policy to respond to secular stagnation and the underlying causes of secular stagnation um, had intensified. So as far as I see it, it, it's fiscal or bust. And the problem with debt isn't really a problem because the central banks are backstopping uh, the funding of the deficits. Yeah, one thing I think about in that comparison to the World War II era was effectively the velocity of that money as well. And so not to get wonky on everybody, but essentially how much it turns over and the productive assets. And so you talked about the Spain on goods. Well, it is a little productive. You know, I'm going to get more out of my house. It does something to employ somebody to do that. But how do we get velocity back? What was the was the late 90s just an aberration that we had this globalization and so it turned over it, it money turned over significantly greater? Is that the aberration? Or is it that we've had this secular stagnation? It keeps in this trend because I think that's really the key. If you want the real growth story, we need to turn over, we need to have productive assets. And I think about that post-World War II in the US. That again, I wasn't around, but from what I read and what I can glean from the data it's telling me that it was velocity, it was projects that had high money multipliers on them. So how do we get that? I think that's really what we all want because that, that lifts all the, all the boats in the rising tide, right? Yeah, look, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't think velocity is a, is a use, useful variable to, to discuss. Um, I, I think what, what, what velocity does, if you believe the, 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 the money equation, MV equals PY, um, <clears throat> velocity simply is the residual. All the, all the movements in the real economy that money doesn't explain um, has to be explained mathematically by velocity. But controlling... It's, the one you, you want, it's a der derivation, right? At the end of the day, correct. it's a residual. It's correct. just the, the thing you can't measure, right? That's right. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I would explain the pickup in velocity in the 90s through nothing more really than the introduction of financial deregulation and sweep accounts that tended to depress your money supply aggregates and guess what velocity went up and then uh, obviously part of the big decline in velocity in the post gfc period was qe which pumped up money supply didn't make it through the real economy and i could have told you that um, and we observe as a result that velocity falls now if you want to use velocity as the framework i think this current stimulus is going to have much more of an impact on velocity because guess what you will get a GDP impact if you're sending checks to people and saying, go spend it. Okay, they haven't spent a lot of it at the moment because we're not we're preventing them from doing that. But I'll tell you what, once, once we uh, hopefully get the vaccine rollout and get this virus under control, uh, you're going to have an almighty period <coughs> of growth as people take that spare powder, dry powder and, and, and go spend it. And I'll tell you what, I'm not willing to suggest that Americans with money in their pocket won't spend it. There's way too much history of that happening. So when that, when that does happen, which I think is a second year story, what you will technically see is velocity start to pick up. But I don't want to frame it in a velocity point. The fact is we've given money to people. We've, we've prevented them from spending it. Once we lift those restri restrictions, they'll spend it. Um, I also think, but to, to get to the heart of the, the question in a sense, if we do get some sensible fiscal policy, um, you know, spending on infrastructure, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't want to talk to Americans about their infrastructure, but, you know, every time I, I land at JFK and, and get the cab in, I mean, if I shut my eyes, I could well be in Nairobi, such is the condition of the cab and the road. I mean, it's, it's a little bit nicer in Nairobi than it is at JFK, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, right. I've not actually been to Nairobi, to be fair. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it's not as if there's no opportunities um, for, for useful spending on infrastructure in, in the States. Um, and I even think there could be some good that comes out of some of the regulatory changes. I mean, in, in my view, one of the big factors behind secular stagnation has been the growth of corporate power, the, the, the so-called oligopolization of many sectors. And that explains one of the real paradoxes of what we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years, which is that funding rates, um, and you would therefore think hurdle rates for the private sector has been dropping in both real and, and nominal terms, which is partly obviously the reduction in the risk-free rate, but also the compression in risk spreads. 
and their reported ROAs and ROEs have gone up. And yet business investment as a share of GDP on a net basis, so taking account of, of depreciation, has been on a secular decline. That's very hard for an economist to explain. Your hurdle rates are dropping. Your returns in terms of incremental return on, on CapEx has not dropped. And yet investment is declining. Now, one of the obvious ways to explain that is, aha, that's exactly what a company with monopoly power does. They reduce their investment. They've got not getting the competition in. <clears throat> and I think this is indicative, not just of the US, but throughout the developed world of some of the problems of allowing companies to dominate their sectors. And if we see appropriate antitrust measures, I think you could see a, a, a notable pickup in both investment and productivity. The sting in the tail, obviously from an investment perspective, is that for equity investors, secular stagnation was terrific because it, it went hand in hand with a rising profit share of GDP, declining rates, the last 30 years, let's face it, have been great for many investors, particularly in the US. And we're now in a situation where, in my view, any policy that threatens to end secular stagnation need not be good for investors. Let's face it, to take the most obvious point, if we see the trend in rates go from down to up, not good for people in the rate space, <clears throat> to the extent that we've seen these very high returns on a sustained basis with low investment due to corporate power, Anything that breaks down corporate power will not be good for investors. So the irony at the moment is we have a setup where arguably good economic policy will not necessarily be great for a lot of investors. And that's the mirror image of the last three decades, which have been an economic circumstance that's not been good for Joe Average, but it's been wonderful for investment returns. Yeah, I think that's a great juxtaposition there. Um, and I think we have to end it there, Gerard. We, we've had so much in there. I mean, uh, you're so passionate. That's why we love reading your stuff too. It, it comes off the page too. So before we let you go, there's two things. First, let our listeners know where they can access your data. Well, um, I, I sell my research to institutional clients like my good friends at DoubleLine. So uh, just send me an email, jared at minacadvisors.com or look me up on Bluebird. Um, happy to have a discussion. Yeah, and I think it's worth people's looks. I mean, uh, definitely love, love the data you put together. So we appreciate that and coming on the show today. But before you leave, Sam has a part of the show that he won't let a guest leave without going into. So Sam, why don't you introduce Gerard to that? Yeah, and that torture rack is called Sherman Says. And that's my favorite part of the show where I offer a series of alternating prompts between you and Mr. Sherman, starting with Sherman here. Uh, to which they will provide a top of mind response. So let's kick it off with uh, uh, U.S. consumer. Rebounding. Strong. I'm thinking retail sales in my head. I'm thinking retail sales, three bad months. I feel the stimulus checks coming. I have to justify myself. I feel like I'm on a torture rack here. The sun is just coming right through the blind at me. So. <laughs> got the bright light in your eyes there. So yeah. Gerard, this one's over to you with uh, Miss Janet Yellen. Well, um, the dove, the dove gets the hand on the lever that matters and uh, she'll be doing everything she can to, to ensure that we have fiscal dominance, um, having had her turn at monetary dominance when she was at the Fed. So she, she's, she's got her hands on a new set of levers. She definitely uh, said that today. I mean, she came out, there's headlines around her talking today. Uh, the, the Republicans are already trying to shoot it down, but she seems like she's juiced up and ready to go. So she's been reading your research. <laughs> she did say also with the uh to maintain dollar strength right so uh this is back to you sherman with covid vaccine rollout unimpressive but we'll get impressive let's hope so uh deflation deflation so last century um <laughs> you know uh look the risk risk is still there but if we in, in a world where um, they're deploying helicopters, that's, that's the antidote. And that's the world we seem to be heading towards. It only took 15 years for Bernanke's dream of the helicopter, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, that speech, making sure it doesn't happen here, uh, remains the, the guidepost. And uh, you just been able to tick off the steps and we finally got to his last one. We've arrived. <laughs> 
All right, next one to Sherman with moral hazard. What did it all cost? All right, Mr. Manek, looking for an attractively valued asset sector here. I guess that's not really a prompt, but attractively valued <laughs> asset sector. Uh, my favorite on a five year view, um, Japanese equities. There's a structural story that's been playing out that's been um, ignored. I, I think this reflation is the catalyst for it to be rewarded. And believe it or not, and I say believe it or not, when uh, Japanese equities were absolutely world's best practice bubble uh, 30 years ago, they now look cheap. Yeah, they just hit a new all time high, according to one of our analysts that put together a chart, except he only went back around 20 years, didn't catch that, that bubble from then. I'm like, they're still down about 30. There's room to run. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Probably four times his uh, financial experience. So 20 years. Uh, all right, I'm going to kick this back to you with $100 oil. Not, not, not near term, but plausible again. All right. Picking up on a word you used earlier, uh, Gerard, with bubble, that's a question mark after it. Oh, look, uh, ex excess valuations and around the fringes of, of the market, the behavior is, is, um, is astounding. Um, and you can see it in, in some of the retail volumes. Um, you know, an interesting uh, piece just put out by one of my friends at SockGen showing that the, the key to performance in equities, US equities this year, year to date, has simply been the, the, the share price number, the, the cheapest share prices. I'm not talking PEs, I'm just talking about yeah, a $2 share price versus a Tesla share price has done better. People are buying numbers because they are low. Uh, that's, that's frothy, that's bubblish. Um, <clears throat> always hard to pick what's going to um, blow it up, um, but when you're a bubble, avoid pricks. Yeah, I, I saw that too about penny stocks. They were in more demand this year than they have been in the last 10 or so. And they were just showing volumes and everything. So um, definitely seems like I got to jump on that one too, Sam, because there was a report put out by Deutsche Bank this morning where they did a survey and they asked, are these asset classes in a bubble? And it was on a scale of one to 10. So you can do it as percentages. And so Bitcoin was the largest at 8.7. So 87%. And it turns out that 12% of their audience uh, said that there were no bubbles. So anyone that identified a bubble, that was their number one uh, choice. Although you could identify all of them. So I, I found that just somewhat interesting since uh, Sam's been building a crypto portfolio as of late. So yeah, it's up to like, uh, or I should say it's down to $30 now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that DB, that DB report that came out today was prompted is what prompted that bubble uh, uh, prompt. So kicked the uh, last one each. Uh, for both of you here, uh, with Sherman's is going to be summer vacation 2021. Iceland. Oh yeah, all right. Some more different, man. I, I want. I, I've been remote. Let's go remote again, and uh, let's go see the good people of Iceland. Uh, ever since uh, Michael Lewis's article uh, talking about Igor, you can just say Igor, and there's 30 people named Igor, and they all know which Igor you're talking about when you say Igor and put it in position. I just want to experience that. So I know you've been, Sam. You may talk me out of it, but that's that's what I'm no, thinking. I loved on it. January 19th. I loved it. I yeah. loved it. It was a great place to be. So hopefully we'll be in a the world will be in a much better place by that time too. So you have a more pleasant experience. So the last one here for you, uh, Gerard, is going to be World Health Organization. Who? Um, yeah. Look, uh, <clears throat> in a in a funny way, they they started badly, but you need. In a, in a global pandemic, global coordinating agencies, and I think they've slowly lifted their game. We, we could have done better. We all could have done better. Um, what will be interesting is to see how this investigation to the origins of the of the COVID nineteen goes, and and whether they will get to the bottom of it. Um, fingers crossed. But uh, here's hoping the vaccine rolls out, get, gets us back to normal. Um, <clears throat> I think Australia is. One of the few countries, I think North Korea is another one that doesn't let its citizens leave. We are locked in here. Uh, we were told uh, yesterday that we probably won't be allowed to travel overseas at all this year. So I'm, I'm hoping we get the vaccine and I'll be able to get out of, bust out of Australia and, uh, and, and just travel anywhere. <laughs>
<laughs> come over and see you guys. Well, as always, we welcome you into Double Line offices. Uh, I always love it when you come in too and give us a new perspective. So we appreciate that. And more importantly, we appreciate all the time you take for, you, you gave us today. And so for that, our listeners, um, uh, hopefully they valued it as well. Uh, Gerard Manak from Manak Advisors, thanks again for uh, joining us today. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, yeah. Sam. Stay safe. Stay safe, stay healthy. And as always, you can catch these podcasts wherever you get your uh, your podcast served from. That's Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, a bunch of them I never heard of still. Uh, we have the Twitter account. You know, the tweeter out there that Sam uses a lot. It's at Sherman Show Pod. Uh, we'll put up some nice clips here. And for those you didn't know and listening to this, uh, we're also posting this on the YouTube channel. So youtube.com backslash double line capital, all one word. Uh, you can see our, our smiling faces and the torture chamber, the sun trying to attack me during this uh, podcast today. So again, Gerard, we appreciate the time. Thanks for all you do. Um, remember, uh, you can get him at Gerard at Manac.com. You can reach out to him, go to the website as well. Thanks again. Mm-hmm.